strokes will happen in as many as one in about 2,200 live births. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 49 of the Stroke Cast. Many folks uh, are surprised to find out that adults in their 20s, 30s, and 40s can have stroke. Mine was an eye-opening experience, well, not only for me, but for an awful lot of people around me. What's often bigger news to people is that adolescents, children, newborns, and even fetuses can have strokes. In fact, stroke in the womb is one of the leading causes of cerebral palsy. Stroke in kids was nothing I had ever even thought about before I started this journey to learn more about my own brain injury. This week, I talk with one of the leading experts in childhood stroke. Strokecast regular Dr. Nirav Shah introduced me to Dr. Heather Fullerton. And Heather and I had a fascinating conversation about stroke in children, the causes, and the generally optimistic recovery path. Dr. Heather Fullerton is a pediatric vascular neurologist at the University of California, San Francisco, one of only a few child neurologists in the country with additional board certification in vascular neurology. She is the Kenneth Raynan Chair in Pediatric Stroke Care, Chief of Child Neurology at the UCSF Department of Neurology, and Director of the Pediatric Stroke and Cerebrovascular Research Group and Pediatric Brain Center at the UCSF Benahoff Children's Hospital. After graduating from Baylor College of Medicine in 1996, Dr. Fullerton came to UCSF for her Pediatrics Residency and Child Neurology Fellowship, and then joined the Child Neurology faculty in 2002. Early in her training, She cared for a two-year-old who suffered a stroke caused by a tear in a neck artery from a fall. After realizing the paucity of research in this field and lack of child neurologists with expertise in stroke, she chose to dedicate her career to the care of such children. Check out strokecast.com slash pediatric stroke to learn more about Dr. Fullerton's background. So now, let's meet Dr. Heather Fullerton. So, Heather, thank you so much for joining me on StrokeCast this week. I'm thrilled we're able to connect. Thanks for inviting me. I always really like opportunities to talk about pediatric strokes, since many people are not familiar with that as an entity. Yeah, very much so. I mean, people are are, are shocked often enough when they find out that I had a stroke at, at age 46, but to think that's... There are six and seven year olds and six month olds uh, having strokes, and it never enters so many people's minds. So I'm definitely thrilled we can uh, we can dive into that and, and talk more about that. Uh, but before we do, how did you know you wanted to get into medicine? For me, it was a little bit circuitous. I was actually in an urban high school. My best friend started to use drugs and I felt like I needed to escape. And so I applied for this magnet school in my city called Health Careers High School. (laughs) I went there really to escape my regular public school, but got exposed to medicine through that high school experience and ended up pursuing it because I really enjoyed it. Well, it's fantastic that that those options were available to you and that we're starting to see some more of these specialized things happen to give folks more opportunities to do things they never even thought they would want to do. That's right. I think just giving kids exposure to different things so that they can develop their interests is so important. Absolutely. And and in terms of developing interests, as you went further into the medical field and got into neurology, what was it about neurology and pediat- and pediatric neurology in particular that drew you to the field? The brain obviously is a pretty fascinating organ and the diseases that affect the brain are really varied, very heterogeneous and obviously really impactful to people that are affected by brain diseases. 
So that certainly drew me into neurology. And then what was so interesting and challenging about pediatric neurology is that the manifestations of brain diseases are very different depending on the age at which that disease occurs. And for stroke, for example, a stroke in an adult can be fairly stereotyped in terms of the presentation, how it affects an adult. But that exact same stroke in the same territory of the brain can manifest in a very different way in an adolescent versus a younger child versus a baby. And I found that to be a really interesting challenge. But also, children just recover better from neurologic diseases and from acquired injuries like stroke. And so there was also this very kind of happy, optimistic aspect of child neurology that also certainly appealed to me. You know, what's what's really interesting about that is, you know, a lot of folks, and I think a lot of stroke support, especially perhaps outside the medical field or perhaps inside it too, is focused on a lot of stroke folks who have stroke may be at the point of winding down their lives if they're having their stroke, you know, at a much, much older age. Whereas with kids, it's, you know, you're really still just beginning your life and setting the foundations for the next, you know, 20, 30, 80 years. Exactly. So the work that we do in treating children with stroke has a very long-term impact. So we're really trying to affect the outcome of a child and make them grow up into a productive member of their community. And so a lot of what we're doing is trying to minimize any sort of injury and then prevent recurrent injury. And that does become so important because any injury they suffer would have consequences for decades. So how common is it? How, I mean, how many, how often, how many children are having stroke? Fortunately, it's rare. In the U.S., it's about 5,000 children per year nationwide. So it's not common, but it certainly is more common in certain age groups, in neonates in particular, The process of being born actually is a time period when you're at increased risk of having a stroke. And so strokes will happen in as many as one in about 2,200 live births. So that's actually a period of particularly high risk right around the time of birth. And then fortunately for the remainder of childhood, the risk is much lower But there are things that can be done when a stroke occurs in a child. And so that early recognition is really critical. Yeah, especially right around birth. That's, you know, we talk about, you know, what adults start to deal with when we start talking about PFOs, a quarter to a third of the population having a PFO that never closed after birth. But right when you're being born, everybody still has that PFO wide open, which put, I imagine, is part of the reason they're at higher risk. Well, and we think that a lot of these strokes probably happen during the actual birth process. The mothers are hypercoagulable, meaning that they form blood clots more easily when they are giving birth. And that's so important to allow them not to bleed excessively as they deliver the placenta. But the baby then is also experiencing that relatively hypercoagulable state, meaning that the baby also forms blood clots more easily. And then we think that the other risk factors for the strokes that happen right around the time of birth are related to infection and inflammation, particularly in the placenta. And so if you have an inflamed placenta because of something like an infection, then you can form a blood clot in the placenta that can actually go to the brain of the baby. But fortunately, after that baby is delivered and outside of that environment, 
then their risk of having another stroke is almost negligible because the causes are all related to things happening around the time of delivery. So so one of the things you mentioned is that it's also important to be able to recognize this. And I know when my stroke presented, it was classic fast symptoms. And more and more folks are becoming aware of what we mean by fast, face, arms, speech, and time, or be fast for balance eyes, face, arms, speech, and time as the signs of a stroke. But it sounds like stroke presents differently in kids than it than it does in adults. So how should parents and other folks around kids, what should they be aware of to uh, as a, as a warning that hey this is a there's a potential stroke happening here. I think that be fast is still something that parents should be aware of, and if they see any stroke like symptoms in a child, they should still take that seriously. Call nine one one, take that child to an emergency room. The difference really is that in very young children. Even if they have a stroke that should cause some motor weakness, so cause weakness on one side of the body, it might not because their brain might not yet be developed enough to have that voluntary motor control. So certainly in those really young infants. And those young infants are more likely to present with seizures. And if they don't have seizures, they might just present with some excessive sleepiness. So really, the doctors that are taking care of a baby around the time of birth need to be aware of that and look for those things. But I think parents of older babies and children should really just follow their instinct. There's not a single parent that I've met who didn't realize something was amiss with their child when that child had a stroke. And sometimes they might second guess themselves. They might think to themselves, this really seems like that stroke that my grandfather had, but children don't have a stroke. So it must not be a stroke. So I shouldn't be as worried about it. I think the message for parents is, If your instinct is telling you that something is wrong and that your child neurologically is not doing what they normally can do, then that should simply be a red flag and you should take that child to an emergency room and have them evaluated. One of the things that I think is probably interesting and may make some things a little bit easier now too is that with the prevalence of of smartphones recording pictures and videos. It's I imagine it's a lot easier now for a parent to go to a, a doctor or an emergency room and with, with their child and be able to say, look, here's what they were like last week and here's where they are today. Something is clearly wrong. That's great advice. And actually, a lot of parents do do that and we find that extremely helpful. It's also fairly common in children for the neurologic symptoms of a stroke to wax and wane. And that's another big difference from an adult where the deficit comes on suddenly and then typically persists. In kids, because of their slightly different blood flow to the brain, that's actually better than in adults, they can actually have these sort of symptoms that seem to come and go. And so they might come to an emergency room and say, my child's face was drooping, but now it's better. The emergency room physician is looking at that child thinking, that looks pretty normal to me. But if they actually took a video showing that time period when the child's face was drooping, then that really will get the attention of that emergency room physician and let them know that something significant was happening. So I think whipping out that phone and taking some brief videos can actually be really important. So with that sort of different pattern in there, that almost sounds a, a little bit like uh, like a TIA, but we're not really talking about TIAs or transient ischemic attacks in this case, are we? Well, it could be because TIAs essentially are a period when you have enough ischemia or lack of blood flow to the brain to cause those nerve cells not to function well. 
And then you can have this period where if the blood flow improves for a while, the symptoms get better, but then the blood flow reduces again and the symptoms get worse. And then the question is, where are you going to end up? Are you going to end up with the blood flow being better established and not having a stroke? Or are you going to end up with the blood flow being poor and completing a stroke? So at that point, when those symptoms are fluctuating, it is really important to recognize it as a blood flow issue so that you can intervene. And there are actually things that we can do as doctors to manipulate blood pressures, for instance, to try to tip them towards ultimately just having a TIA or the transient event without having a completed stroke. Right, right. So when it comes to treating these pediatric strokes, are, are things like TPA or mechanical thrombectomy an option or is the just because of the size of the person just it just doesn't isn't a safe option for for children? I would say that that's still a bit controversial. When we were really limited to IV TPA as our only hyperacute therapy option, there were pretty substantial concerns about applying that to children because the dose of that medication for children actually was not clear. When we moved into this new era of being able to offer endovascular therapies. It removes that issue of pediatric dosing of a medication. And now it's really a mechanical issue. You have a blood clot that's occluding an artery to the brain. You have these devices that mechanically can remove a blood clot. The pediatric considerations regarding that then are not medication dosing issues, but really more issues around things like size of the child, the causes of the stroke being different in children, which can affect safety of doing a procedure like that. And then also issues around radiation exposure in children, because when you're doing these thrombectomy procedures, there is radiation exposure. So there are a number of considerations but I think overall, we feel like it is a promising therapy to be able to offer children. And some centers are offering it, although only with a thorough discussion with families about the lack of data for doing this in children and the known risk of the procedure but the potential benefits that a child might theoretically experience with the procedure. So we're hoping that we can actually gather more data about pediatric thrombectomy in a prospective trial. And there's some different investigators working together now to design such a trial. But I think we are optimistic about it and feel like there are a lot of reasons why this intervention makes sense as a possible intervention for children as well. I think certainly people are comfortable offering it to teenagers because physically they're close to the size of adults. And the question is really about using it in, in younger children. That's kind of amazing to think about, you know, just outside the field, you start looking at this and look at how small and precise those instruments have to be to operate uh, to work with an adult and to think now starting to just conceptually the idea of doing that on such a small child with smaller blood vessels. And it, it's just mind boggling and amazing where the technology is, is starting to allow things to happen. Right. But definitely a lot of concern with doing it in smaller children and the centers that are offering this now are centers where the neurointerventional radiologists that do the thrombectomy have experience doing endovascular procedures in children. And so there are other reasons why cerebral angiograms are done in children, which is basically a similar sort of diagnostic procedure where you're putting catheters into the blood vessels in the brain. 
if people have experience with doing that in children and young children, then I think that's important experience for considering doing thrombectomy in young children. I think that experience, though, is really important and does have to play into decision making about pediatric thrombectomy going forward. Mm, absolutely. So, so what are some of the most frequent causes of pediatric stroke once we're out of that uh, sort of neonatal phase? We divide it up into a couple different categories. I think the first division can be, is this a child who has some sort of chronic condition versus an otherwise healthy child? There are a few chronic conditions that are associated with increased risk of stroke. One example is sickle cell anemia, which can cause injury to the blood vessels to the brain over time. And those children are at risk for stroke, but fortunately, there are now actually some very good strategies for identifying risk of stroke and then treating those children to prevent stroke. So really important for kids with sickle cell disease to have conversations with their hematologists about that. The other population of children at risk are those that have structural abnormalities of the heart that we call congenital heart disease. And there are certain types of congenital heart disease that particularly put children at high risk of stroke. And then there are also certain genetic conditions that we know increase a risk of stroke. One example is trisomy 21. Another example is neurofibromatosis. So there are a few of these genetic syndromes that increase risk of stroke. And the other category of, of children are the previously well child that suddenly presents with their first time stroke. I should mention that in children, we're talking about both ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. And in adults, most strokes, about 85% are ischemic. So the type where not enough blood is getting to the brain and only about 15% are hemorrhagic where you have bleeding in the brain. In kids, it's different. It's actually about 50-50. Interesting. And when a child who's previously healthy has that first-time hemorrhagic stroke bleeding into the brain, it's usually because they have an underlying malformation of the blood vessels, something that we call an arteriovenous malformation or a cavernous malformation. So usually there's a malformation in the brain. When you think about ischemic strokes, though, in a previously healthy child, those happen for very different reasons. One is dissection, where you have a tear in the wall of a blood vessel. And I'm sure you're familiar with that because that's actually also a common cause of stroke in young adults. But then we also see a number of different types of arteriopathies or diseases of blood vessels to the brain that are a bit more unique to childhood. One is Moya Moya disease, where you develop this chronic narrowing of the blood vessels to the brain. And the other is something that's very uniquely pediatric that we call focal cerebral arteriopathy of childhood. And that seems to be an acute inflammatory disease of the blood vessels just on one side of the brain. So it doesn't affect blood vessels on both sides. It's just on one side. And those children will present with sudden onset weakness on one side of the body and will have this very acute narrowing of the blood vessels that can actually get worse over a course of days. That's one of the most common causes, actually, of ischemic stroke in a child and something that is very rarely seen in young adults and not really described at all in older adults. And some of the most common causes in adult stroke tends to be often a lot of the lifestyle factors when we start looking at blood blood pressure and cholesterol and uh, diabetes and all these things that can contribute it. But I imagine we don't see as much of that in children just due to they just haven't had time to have problems resulting from those lifestyle factors yet. Or, or are you starting to see lifestyle factors leading to stroke in, uh, in adolescence or, or even younger? 
That's been a really important question for us. So we've actually been working on an NIH-funded study called Stroke in the Young. With the obesity epidemic in children, we were really concerned about atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries presenting with stroke in childhood. And so these risk factors that you're talking about that we call the traditional stroke risk factors like obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure are the causes of atherosclerosis. And we have found that although atherosclerosis certainly begins in childhood, and there are some other studies demonstrating that, that atherosclerosis certainly is a childhood disease, and these factors are important in children and should be well controlled in children, not just in adults. But fortunately, it does not cause stroke in children. And it seems like in the study that we've done, these atherosclerotic risk factors start to emerge as causes of stroke in young adulthood, really by the 30s and the 40s, and less so in the 20s. So again, super important to recognize these factors. Vascular health is important, and it starts at a young age, but it's not a cause of stroke in childhood. What I think is really interesting, and yeah, definitely very important, we want to get get started on that early, is as I don't know if there's a shift happening in pop culture or a shift happening in the medical field, or if it's just that I'm starting to go learn more and more about all of this stuff related to strokes and neurology, is that really oftentimes we think of brain and neurological issues as a problem of the brain, a problem of the of the nerve nervous system. But really, it's a problem of the vascular system. It's a problem of the circulatory system that is leading to these other problems. And it's an interesting perspective to start thinking about it that way. That's right. And I think it certainly has implications because obviously you have blood vessels to other important organs as well. And so you have to be thoughtful about that whenever you see a disease of blood vessels to the brain, are there other blood vessels to other organs that are also involved? Some of the good news or uh, or better news that comes out of, out of this, at least, is that, as you mentioned earlier, children seem to recover faster from these injuries than adults said. We often hear that kids' brains are more flexible and it's why they can learn second languages before the age of six uh, a heck of a lot faster than than adults. Uh, so how does the youth impact neuroplasticity? Is that why they're recovering faster or is it a denser configuration of blood vessels or or, or what's behind the, the faster recovery of kids? So this is part of why I was interested in child neurology in the first place. So this whole issue of how does a disease differentially impact the developing brain? The brain is undeveloped at the time of birth, and pretty substantial changes happen over the first few years of life, but then that development actually continues through childhood. And there are aspects of the brain, especially those frontal lobes that are important for judgment and impulsive behavior that are not fully developed until young adulthood <laughs> and <laughs> develop more slowly in boys than in, in girls, which explains why boys often persist with slightly more impulsive behaviors um, as adolescents. And why by the time we're 30, we start going, what was I thinking? <laughs> Exactly. So the, the good thing is that if you injure part of your brain because of a stroke or any other reason like a traumatic injury, the other parts of your brain that are still developing have a much greater capacity to take over the functions of the injured brain. And so if, for instance, you have a stroke to your language area, if you're an adult, you'll develop difficulty speaking, 
you'll have some improvement after your stroke, but it's going to be fairly limited. And then baby, where language hasn't even developed yet, if they have a stroke in their language area, they will simply develop language in another part of the brain. And language is clearly such an important function that the brain prioritizes that. And a baby with a stroke grows up to become a child. And if you test that child, their language function actually is within normal limits. So they can have perfectly normal language function. And in older child, they might have more impaired language function, but they can actually have really excellent recoveries. And when you do special types of the imaging, like what we call functional MRI imaging that allows you to see where a certain function is located in the brain, you can actually see how that language function has moved. And sometimes it actually moves to the opposite side of the brain. And sometimes it just moves forward in the brain to an area of healthy brain. But it's the fact that the brain is still developing and acquiring skills that gives it that flexibility, or we call it plasticity, to recover and move important functions to other parts of the brain. That's one of the most amazing things about the brain because it doesn't work anywhere else in the system. When your liver fails, your pancreas doesn't step up and take over that function. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think and, and the neuroplasticity that is so important, we talk about that, but what's really important for even adult stroke survivors to think that, you know, it may take longer than it does in kids, but it still happens. It's There's just more stuff in the brain at that point to shift and move around. It's like when you try and find new space for a function in, in a fully packed closet, it's, it's a lot harder to move the stuff around. Right. And we see that that becomes really important in children with multiple strokes you have a better recovery the more healthy brain you have that can take over the function of the injured brain. That's why we try so hard to prevent multiple strokes in children, because the more strokes you have and the closet is really cluttered and there aren't a lot of open spaces to accept that new responsibility then it becomes harder for a child to recover. So we try really hard to prevent recurrent strokes because a child with a single stroke can have a really amazing recovery, but a child with a second or third stroke is going to have a much more limited recovery. So what, what do parents and schools most need to know about pediatric stroke in general? I think for parents of children who are healthy and have never been affected by stroke, really they shouldn't know anything more than the fact that strokes happen in kids. And so if you think a child is having a stroke, you should act as if that child is having a stroke and get them that urgent attention. There still is a very good chance that that child is not having a stroke and there can be mimics of stroke in children. So things like seizures, Migraine headache can act as stroke mimics, but you need to act as if a child is having a stroke and treat them that way until you've ruled out that possibility. And, and even if, if it's not a stroke, there's still something that needs to be taken care of. <laughs> that is true. Yes. Yeah, so certainly seizures need to be taken care of and also migraine. So getting that rapid medical attention is important. I would say if you're the parent of a child who's at risk for stroke, so a child of a parent with sickle cell disease or with congenital heart disease, then it's really important to talk to your doctors about that stroke risk. What can you be doing to minimize that stroke risk? What should you do if a child, if your child has stroke symptoms? Being prepared if, if you have a child that is at increased risk of having a stroke. And then there's a different question of, of what do parents in schools need to know about helping a child who has had a stroke? And this is where I think 
schools actually tend to do a really good job that they have infrastructure in place for evaluating children who have different disabilities for other reasons. And so they can evaluate a child who has a stroke and help them with their educational needs. The one limitation is that if you have a child that has a very severe injury, such as a birth asphyxia, where you don't have enough blood to the entire brain, the schools really recognize that as an impaired child who needs a lot of resources. Kids with stroke can actually recover so well that teachers in schools almost forget that they ever had a brain injury and the child is really functioning at such a high level. But sometimes we see that even though they've had a very good recovery, they can have some subtle deficits that make it more challenging for them to function in school as school gets more difficult. And so it's important never to forget that a child has had a brain injury, even if they've had a really good recovery. And if that child is ever struggling in school, to think maybe it is because of that stroke that they had years ago and actually do some more sophisticated testing that we call neuropsychological testing to identify some specific areas of weakness that might not at all be noticeable just in conversation or playing with a child, but might actually be limiting them when they're doing more challenging things like reading, writing, arithmetic, So it's important to never forget about a prior stroke. Right. Once the brain gets really stressed with with working to its max, there's stuff may show up there. Exactly. But I'm also guessing that a child who's had a stroke should probably avoid activities, for example, like football or something, which may be more of a concussion prone activity or some other physical activities like that. Or is that really a non-issue by the time they get get to high school? As neurologists, I think we're always looking for reasons to advise children against participating in contact sports that (laughs) we know have a high risk of um, brain injury. So we certainly have a low threshold to, um, to advise against contact sports like football. But it really is um, something that we consider on a case-by-case basis. If a child's had a stroke because of a heart issue that has since been fixed, they might not need to have any activity restrictions and really should just do everything that they can do. On the other hand, if a child's had a stroke because of a dissection, a tear in the wall of a blood vessel, we're worried that perhaps they have some mild weakness in the walls of the blood vessel. And so those are kids that we would be more likely to say, you know, probably think about doing some other sport. Although I do remember one child that I took care of who was a competitive wrestler, which definitely can cause a lot of neck injuries. So I suggested that he stop wrestling and he did. And then he came back to clinic a year later and told me that he had taken up car racing instead. (laughs) So I'm not sure that was the the best um, idea in terms of risk assessment, but, um, but that was his solution. If he couldn't wrestle, he would take up car racing. (laughs) Well, okay then. And uh, and of course, I'm always plugging the debate team. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Flexing those mental muscles. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That then becomes even more brain therapy. <laughs> exactly. So, Heather, this has been fantastic. I, I have learned a ton, and uh, I hope our listeners have have learned a lot as well. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I really appreciate the attention you're giving to this issue. It's important that people know strokes happen in kids, too. And that brings us to the hack of the week. Using a phone one-handed is certainly an option. It's how I get by most of the time now. But as phones get bigger, and we prefer to look at bigger screens, one-handed use can become more challenging. 
you have to reach further with your thumb to touch parts of the screen or to tap out a text message. And I find there are just some things that are just, I just can't reach with my thumb on my phone now. And you really want to use all those functions you paid for. And you have to be able to do that without dropping the phone. Something I have not been nearly as successful about as I would like. Now, you could put the phone on a flat table, and that helps. It makes a difference. But then sometimes the angle might be uncomfortable, or the screen might be difficult to read. Instead, look for a dashboard or car window mount for your cell phone. You don't have to use these things in a car. Usually, they have a suction cup mount or a beanbag mount that you can use to hold your phone where you want it on your desk, coffee table, nightstand, or other surface. Then you can tap away at any part of the screen since you don't have to hold it in your hand. So what do you think about the things that Dr. Fullerton shared? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash pediatric stroke. Be sure that the folks that you know who are involved with kids know that stroke can happen in children and that the be fast stroke signs are things to look for. Be fast again is balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, and time to call the ambulance. You can share this episode with other folks by giving them the link strokecast.com slash pediatric stroke. Consider a car mount for your desk for your cell phone. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The StrokeCast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The StrokeCast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.